Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General. Sorry, Anna, I think you're on mute. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I am Anna Wise and I am an undergrad intern here at the Blum Center. Today's program is part of our dermatology series, a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Department of Dermatology at Mass General. Before I get started, I just want to go over a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that you are in listen-only mode. Everyone has been muted so hear our guest speaker today. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, you may use the chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for in the end. Only Blum Center staff and our guest speaker will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat. If you have a personal medical question, please ask your doctor. Lastly, at the end of today's session, you'll be directed to a brief survey, which we'd like to ask you to help us complete. Your feedback is important to us as we plan future programs. Okay, so next I'm gonna turn it over to Anna who will introduce you all to today's guest speaker. Hello, today here with us, we have Dr. Ramon Williams. Dr. Williams is a dual fellowship trained mole surgeon and cosmetic dermatolo dermatologic surgeon and is double board certified in dermatology and micrographic dermatologic surgery. Dr. Williams, Clinical interests include micrographic surgery, facial reconstruction, cosmetic excisions, laser, Botox, dermal fillers, chemical peels, and skin of color dermatology. Professionally, Dr. Williams is a member of several associations, including the American Academy of Dermatology, the American College of Mole Surgery, the American Society of Dermatologic Surgery, and the Skin of Color Society. In recognition of Skin Cancer Awareness Month, she's here to give a talk on skin cancer and sun safety. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Williams. All right, thank you, Anna and Amy, for the wonderful introduction. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my, my screen. Give me one moment. All right. So hello, every, hello everyone, my name is Ramon Williams and I will be speaking today about skin cancer and sun safety. Um, I have no conflicts to discuss. And uh, this is a special month in May because this is Skin Cancer Awareness Month. Here we have an infographic from the Skin Cancer Foundation and it talks about how more people are diagnosed with skin cancer in the US than any other cancer combined. So very important topic that I have the honor of speaking about today. So here's an outline for today's talk. Um, we'll briefly introduce skin cancer. Then we'll go into the various types of skin cancers, particularly the most common ones. Uh, we'll review the warning signs of skin cancer. We will also review skin cancer treatments and the best methods for pre prevention. And then lastly, I'll say a few words on sunscreen and how to select the best sunscreen to optimize your protection from the sun. So skin cancer is the most common type of human cancer. Here we have another infographic from the Skin Cancer Foundation. And we can see that basal cell carcinoma or BCC and squamous cell carcinoma make up the most common types of skin cancer. For basal cell, over 3.6 million cases are diagnosed annually and for squamous cell, almost two, almost two million cases annually. One in five Americans will develop skin cancer during their lifetime. And the risk of skin cancer is much higher in lighter skin types. Lighter skin types are defined as uh, patients or individuals that may have lighter eyes, individuals that tend to freckle, and individuals that almost always burn in the sun and never tan. The average annual UV radiation does correlate with the incidence of skin cancer, which is why we'll be focusing on prevention today, which is so important. 
Here we have a graph also showing the prevalence of skin cancer by race and ethnicity. By far, non-Hispanic white individuals are more, are more likely to develop skin cancer. And we can see in patients of other races and ethnicities, for example, Hispanic patients, patients of African-American or Black um, ethnicity, as well as Asian patients are much less likely to develop skin cancer. However, I do want to point out that despite a lower prevalence, morbidity and mortality associated with skin cancer in skin of color is disproportionately high, which is why it's important to consider all skin types as we have these discussions. Now we'll briefly review the types of skin cancer. The most common type of skin cancer is basal carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma. This is followed by squamous cell carcinoma. These are abbreviated as BCC and SCC respectively. Less common is melanoma, but as we know, this is one of the more serious uh, types of skin cancer. And lastly, we do have rare tumors, which is beyond the scope of the discussion today, but it's important to note that um, it's possible for individuals to be diagnosed with a variety of types of skin cancer. We'll start our talk off with basal cell carcinoma. As mentioned, this is the most common type of skin cancer. It commonly develops in patients with lighter skin types and it may develop in patients with skin of color. It usually develops after years of sun exposure. So oftentimes I'll see a patient in clinic and they'll tell me, you know, but doc, I don't get sun anymore. I'm never in the sun. And actually it's important to think back to um, history, childhood history of sunburns and sun exposure that has happened throughout the years. The median age of diagnosis of skin cancer is 68. So typically these will develop older in life and it's associated with intermittent and rec recreational sun exposure. So again, this highlights the importance of good sun protection. Also, it's important to note that patients who are immunosuppressed, for example, patients who may have undergone an organ transplant or stem cell transplant are at higher risk of developing basal cell. So how to spot a basal cell carcinoma? So here we have um, an image from Visual DX, and this is a classic image of a basal cell carcinoma. This is quite zoomed in, but I do want to review the um, uh, salient features of a basal cell. So typically these are shiny and pearly. They're often skin colored, but not always. They may also be pigmented in patients with skin of color. Um, also a pink quality is often seen to these. And as I mentioned, patients with skin of color may have a pigmented sub subtype. So depending on the background skin tone, these may appear to be more of a darker brown. So important to note that there are a variety of presentations of these. Here we have an image of a basal cell carcinoma on the ear of a patient. Again, this image is from Visual DX. Uh, one thing that I do want to point out about skin cancer is that cancer in general is referred to the wound that never heals. So in particular, skin cancer tends to be lesions or wounds that do not go away. So a lot of times patients will tell me, oh, I thought it was a pimple or I thought it was just a blemish, but your body has the capacity to heal benign lesions. For example, if it's a pimple or acne, your body and your immune system have the capacity to get rid of those. If something is really persisting for many months, that's a red flag that you should see your your doctor and dermatologist for further workup and management. So let's talk about the progression of basal cell carcinoma. How do these change with time and why is it important for us to manage these? Basal cell carcinoma uh, shown here is um, very common in these sun exposed areas. They can get quite large. So these can grow in size. This is a, a three-dimensional view of a basal cell carcinoma. And we can see that there has been some horizontal growth. These may also grow in depth. This is considered vertical growth. And this can become uh, concerning as well because these have the capacity to ulcerate. In basal cell carcinomas that do ulcerate, one may experience uh, bleeding or pain associated with the lesion, which may prompt um, either uh, even sooner management of these. These can also extend so deep vertically that they are involving nerves, blood vessels, or other structures. The important thing to note about basal cell carcinoma is that metastasis is quite rare. Um, it typically is occurring in one to 1,000 cases to one to 35,000 cases, so extremely rare. I typically tell my patients that if, if 
this spreads, it would be reportable. Um, the important part is to have this treated in a relatively uh, prompt time frame, and this uh, will most often prevent uh, progression of the lesion and uh, Importantly, metastasis or poor outcomes are associated with more aggressive types of uh, basal cell. Next, we'll move into squamous cell carcinoma. This is the second most common skin cancer. These tend to arise in a background of sun damaged skin, but these can also occur in areas that are traditionally sun protected. They are associated with cumulative sun exposure. So the amount of sun exposure that has uh, really accumulated over time and over many years and decades of life. They can appear as a pink scaly plaque um, or patch, and they are um, much more common in our patients with organ transplants. There can be an up to 65 times increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma in patients with organ transplants, which is extremely high. There are subtypes of squamous cell carcinoma, and I do want to point out that we think of squamous cell carcinoma as a continuum. So what does that mean? It means that there are precursor lesions or quote unquote precancers that we refer to as actinic keratoses. These tend to be thin scaly patches on the skin. Sometimes they may feel like cornflakes. Over years or decades, these may progress to squamous cell carcinoma, which are no longer precancerous, but are truly cancerous. Squamous cell carcinoma in situ is considered stage zero. These are very thin and um, very amenable to treatment. These may progress in term to invasive squamous cell carcinoma. So you can see that this is um, deeper than the previous uh, lesion that's shown. Traditionally, surgical management will be the uh, method of choice uh, for these uh, skin cancers. So how do we spot a squamous cell carcinoma? What are some signs of what these may look like on the skin? So here we have an image of the precursor lesion. This is an actinic keratosis. So right next to the eyebrow here, we have a thin scaly patch. Um, typically you can feel these even more, you, even more than you can see them or appreciate them with your eyes. Here we have another actinic keratosis, even more subtle here. Just I'll use my uh, pointer just to show it's right in here. So there's just a subtle pink. If you were able to touch that area, it would feel very rough, a lot more rough than the surrounding skin. And again, these images are from Visual DX. Here's an image of an actinic keratosis being treated in clinic. These are effectively treated with cryotherapy or liquid nitrogen, and this is done in the clinic. Here you can see the nozzle um, or cold spray being applied to the skin. It hurts or stings for just a few seconds. Uh, pretty quick and easy treatment to do in clinic. There are also um, topical therapies and light therapies that can be done to treat these lesions. Importantly, we want to prevent that transformation to squamous cell carcinoma. So here we have an image of a squamous cell carcinoma. You can see that compared to our previous image, these are much more uh, well-defined. We can see the borders here. The scale on this lesion is a lot more thick and um, raised, and we can see that the color pink is also a little bit more intense than the photos that we've seen in the past. So it's possible that this may have been an actinic keratosis, or it may have been a lesion that just appeared quite suddenly on a patient's skin. Everyone's history is a little bit different. So let's talk about the progression of squamous cell carcinoma and why it's important for these to be treated. So there is a risk of local destruction and disfigurement with squamous cell carcinoma as there was with basal cell carcinoma. The risk of metastasis is higher in squamous cell carcinoma. We think about it a little bit more than basal cell carcinoma. This does depend on the stage of squamous cell carcinoma. For very early stage, um, metastasis really is not a concern, but we do unfortunately have patients who present with very advanced disease, high stage squamous cell carcinoma, and we do consider the risk of metastasis. So for an average low risk uh, case of squamous cell carcinoma, the rate is low at 4%. However, if a patient presents with a much more advanced um, tumor of squamous cell carcinoma, that risk of metastasis can be as high as 25%. So really important to get checked by your dermatologist. Um, we'll now review melanoma. This is the least common, um, but the most serious. 
So again, melanoma is the most serious skin cancer. This does have a higher tendency to spread or metastasize. It's much less common than basal cell and squamous cell. 20 Americans unfortunately pass away from melanoma each day. These can develop in a pre-existing mole or they can appear suddenly or de novo. Early diagnosis and treatment are crucial. So what are the risk factors for melanoma? Even one blistering sunburn during childhood can double a patient's risk for developing melanoma. So again, this highlights how critical it is for us to really practice and adopt uh, sun protective behaviors. And this is starting from infancy and um, just as important in, in adulthood. Tanning beds also increase the risk of melanoma. There are various stages of melanoma. Melanoma in situ is the earliest stage of melanoma. This is considered stage zero. And uh, we have great uh, dermatologists here in Boston and here at Mass General. And we pick up a lot of melanomas very early at, um, at this in situ stage. Some patients will get diagnosed with invasive melanoma. We can see from our infographic here that this is much deeper and there is a concern in this case for local and distant spread. So the depth of melanoma is actually what will determine that prognosis, not necessarily how wide it is. And this will also determine the staging of the melanoma. Here we have um, some survival curves. I won't go into um, a lot of detail here, but we can see stage one has excellent survival, but once we're down at stage four, survival rates are much lower. There have been amazing um, advances in melanoma care, particularly in immunotherapy. So our survival, um, you know, looking forward and in years to come um, is improving. However, um, we really want to catch these early. That will definitely confer a survival benefit to our patients. So how to spot a melanoma? Melanoma can appear on any surface of the skin, including the nails. So here we have another image from Visual DX, and this shows an example of a melanoma of the nail. We can see that there's a dark streak in the nail. It's standing out and not really blending in with that background skin color of the nail. And we can see that even within that streak, there are various colors of brown. So this is definitely something that you would wanna see your dermatologist for. Here's another image of a melanoma. At first glance, this may look like a normal mole. However, as dermatologists, we're trained to look at various things, which we'll go into a little bit in detail, but we can see that the borders of this are a little bit irregular and there are multiple colors here. There's not just one shade of brown, there are multiple shades of brown, and this is actually a melanoma. Here we have another image of a melanoma on the back. These are all from Visual DX. Again, we're seeing an area on the back that looks like a mole, but it looks abnormal. It has multiple colors and a very irregular shape. So what are the warning signs of melanoma? Here we have a zoomed in image of a melanoma. This is from um, the AAD website. And there are a couple of things that we look for. A stands for asymmetry. This means that if we take a lesion and we divide it in half, is it similar on one side compared to the other, or is it symmetric? If it's not symmetric, then that may be a red flag that it could be a melanoma. The next thing we wanna look at is B, the border. This border is quite irregular. If I tried to take a pencil and circle it, I would be making a lot of unusual movements. It wouldn't be a nice, perfect circle. So that's another red flag. The color here, we're seeing multiple shades of brown. That's also something that should pique our suspicion that something isn't quite right. Uh, and then for D, we have A, B, C, D, now D the diameter here. So anything larger than six millimeters, which is around the size of a pencil eraser, should also be a red flag saying, hey, this is something that should be checked or at least followed on a regular basis by dermatology. And lastly, we have evolving. How is this changing over time? Is it changing rapidly? In some cases, especially in childhood, it may be normal for a mole to grow in proportion with that child or even with a young adult. However, if you ever have a skin lesion that's rapidly changing, that's also something that should be brought to the attention of your primary care physician or your dermatologist. So let's review um, some warning signs. So as I mentioned, a changing mole is a warning sign, a scaly patch, um, I really want to highlight the sore that doesn't heal. Again, cancer is traditionally that wound that never heals. That should really be a red flag for you to seek medical, medical care. And in particular for melanoma, it can also pre present as a streak under the nail. Squamous cell carcinoma also has a, prede a predilection for the nail bed. 
So what do, what do you do? If you see a concerning spot, there are a few things you, you can do. Uh, certainly take a photo. Sometimes at the time that you're seen for your appointment, um, it may have changed from the moment that you first identified it, but always see a board certified dermatologist. You can ask for a referral from your primary care provider or contact the Department of Dermatology directly. So skin cancer always requires a biopsy for a formal diagnosis. Uh, that's important as well. So let's review treatment options. So there are a variety of treatment options for skin cancer. Um, one is electrodesiccation and curettage. In uh, simplified terms, this is a scrape and burn. This is a quick and easy procedure in the office where we're able to um, uh, essentially apply some local anesthetic so that the procedure is comfortable and remove the skin cancer right there in the office. There are also excisional surgery and Mohs surgery also done in the office under local anesthesia. I'll go into a little bit more about what Mohs surgery is. And another uh, treatment method that we do use um, depending on the situation is radiation. So we do work with our colleagues in radiation oncology, depending on whether or not the patient is not a good surgical candidate or the particular features of that tumor. So I'm a Mohs surgeon uh, by practice. Mohs is an amazing field. Um, it's been around for a while now and it's named after Frederick Mohs. And it's a very cool technique that allows us to get clear margins on the day of surgery and offers excellent cure rates. So Mohs surgery is a gold standard in skin cancer treatment. It offers the highest cure rate, as I mentioned. It is the most precise method of treatment. And uh, we really consider it patient-centered care. Um, patients are awake and comfortable during the procedure and really able to participate as much as they want in their care. And Mohs often offers the best outcomes for skin cancers. So here again, I have the um, illustration of a skin cancer that we showed earlier. Most surgery involves cutting a thin disc of tissue around the skin cancer. And this is considered the first layer of surgery. So in most surgery, the skin cancer is removed one thin layer at a time. So here we have the layer of skin that has been removed. And what happens is, is that we take this layer of skin into the lab. This layer of skin is actually frozen in a cryostat and cut into very small pieces, which is then converted into a glass slide by our amazing histotechs that we work closely with. The glass slide is then read under a microscope. And so as a Mohs surgeon, I work both as a Mohs surgeon and a pathologist for any particular surgery. And I'm carefully checking the margins to make sure that the margins are completely free of any skin cancer before the patient leaves or undergoes a surgical repair. So this is an example of what is considered a surgical defect following Mohs surgery. So here we have it highlighted, we've removed the skin cancer. And if we take a look at the skin, now there's gonna be a defect that we either have to allow to heal on its own or be repaired. One point I do wanna highlight, again, we have a, a illustration here of the surgical repair, is that when we repair in a traditional um, sense, or if we perform a linear repair, we actually have to add two standing cones to the edge of the surgical defects. So a surgical defect in most surgery is most often a circle. We have to add two cones to kind of transition this into a canoe shape. And that ensures that this closes in a cosmetically and functionally appealing way. Um, and offers the best outcome. So a lot of times patients will come in and they'll say, oh, you know, it looked like such a small skin cancer, but what you can actually be left with is a, a pretty significant repair. Usually these heal beautifully, but it's just something to be aware of and another point for being treated promptly. And the typical ratio for the surgical defects to the length of the linear repair is a three to one or four to one ratio. So you may have stitches that are actually four times the length of the final defect of that skin cancer. So let's um, talk a little bit about sunscreen and how to select um, the best sunscreen. So when you're looking at a label, um, it can be very overwhelming. Typically there's a lot of text on the front and on the back of our sunscreen. So here we have an image of um, 
a brand of sunscreen. And one of the things that I'm paying attention to as a dermatologist in the drugstore is that it says broad spectrum. This is really important because we want both UVA and UVB protection. Um, we want protection from the most common um, UV rays, and that's going to be both UVA and UVB. So you really want to see that your sunscreen is labeled broad spectrum. The next thing to look at is the SPF. We generally recommend SPF 30 or higher. So a lot of times people may be wearing a moisturizer that contains sunscreen or even makeup that contains sunscreen. Typically these SPF numbers are quite low, like 15, and that really doesn't cut it. We want a higher SPF 30, 40, 50. The exact number is not so important. As long as it's higher than 30, we are um, considering that sufficient. So zinc or titanium dioxide are considered physical um, blockers. We'll go into a little bit more detail about that, but you really want to see that uh, your sunscreen contains either zinc or titanium. Zinc is what you will find uh, most often in the drugstore, but you definitely want to have zinc. Water resistant is not 100% necessary, but it is a plus if you are going to be on a beach trip or um, um, if you're doing sports where you're sweating a lot, having a water resistant sunscreen is actually going to be very beneficial. Typically, we are recommending that you reapply the sunscreen. So now we'll go into the types of sunscreen. So as I mentioned, we really recommend a physical sunscreen. These are going to consist of either titanium dioxide or zinc oxide. Some sunscreens actually contain both. Physical sunscreens work like a shield. Chemical sunscreens are also very effective. These work like a, a sponge. They tend to be easier to blend in, especially for darker skin types or patients with skin of color. So this may be particularly important. I would say, you know, keeping in mind the important factors that we discussed on the first slide, find a sunscreen that you really like and that works for you. The sunscreen that you're gonna wear is gonna be the best sunscreen. And we recommend wearing sunscreen daily particularly if you have a history of sun, sun damage or if you're particularly prone to skin cancer, but in general, we recommend sunscreen for all our patients year round. So tips for sunscreen application. So apply sunscreen 15 minutes prior to going, to, going outdoors. You wanna work this into your morning routine if possible. Adults actually need one ounce to fully cover the body. So essentially you're probably needing more than you're applying. So keep that in mind. That's why it's nice to have a formulation that blends easily. Apply to all bare or exposed skin. Remember to protect your lips. A lot of vendors will offer um, lip balm with sunscreen. So that's something you wanna consider as well. Cover your scalp, wear a hat or a spray spray um, on exposed air of the scalp and men um, in particular um, are very prone to getting sunscreen on the scalp. This is both melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancers. Remember to reapply sunscreen every two hours or after swimming or getting wet. So now we'll summarize everything that we've discussed today. We're getting towards the end of our talk. So skin cancer is the most common cancer. Um, there are three most common types of skin cancer, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma and melanoma, of which melanoma is the most serious type of skin cancer. Sun safety and skin cancer prevention go hand in hand. And if you have a suspicious spot on your skin, please see a board certified dermatologist. These are my references. I wanted to open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams, for an extremely helpful presentation. We are now at the end of the session, so if you have any questions for Dr. Williams, feel free to enter them in the chat. Can you tell us a little bit more about sunscreens? Are there any particular ones we should look for for young children and including what age to start using them? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, sunscreen um, in general will be um, specifically marketed towards particular age groups. So for uh, children and infants, um, there tend to be sunscreen for babies. Typically we'll say baby, not child. Um, there are a variety of brands. I, I won't name specific brands uh, for the sake of the talk, but typically um, it will be branded. Um, 
infants uh, over the age of um, six months, if it's um, a sunscreen that is marketed towards um, infants or babies, um, you know, typically that's an age that you can start thinking about sunscreen, but it does depend on the label and it does depend on the ingredients. Typically a physical blocker such as zinc oxide will be the safest for younger children. Zinc oxide is actually very similar to the ingredient that's found in many um, zinc-based diaper cream. So you really want to read the label and the label itself will have information about what specific age group that the sunscreen is safe for. For infants who are very young, there are other ways that you can protect them from the sun. You want to keep them in, in the shade and seek shade. There is um, clothing that is particularly uh, sun protective that is intended for infants as well. Hats, um, very lightweight, long sleeve clothing. So there are many things that you can think about. And when in doubt, ask your pediatrician as well as your board certified dermatologist. Thank you. Can you share a little bit more about the clothing that you're talking about and um, what to look for? Can we, are they safe to wash in the machines? Yes, so great question. So I think that it, UPF clothing is one of the best kept secrets in dermatology. There are a variety of brands that sell this clothing, um, but essentially uh, UPF is similar to SPF, but UPF is specific to materials and clothing. And these are particularly designed for um, wear during uh, the summertime or during sunny days. It's intentionally very lightweight because manufacturers understand that you'll be wearing this clothing in hot weather. However, it does offer good protection from the sun. These are rated in a similar way um, as SPF is, is rated as well. You can get hats, long sleeve clothing. In terms of care, this will vary based on the manufacturer, but typically these are safe for machine wash. You just have to double check the label because I said it depends on the manufacturer, but most of these are super easy to care for. These are things that you can pack on your vacation and not even worry about it and just wear like you would your usual wardrobe. They're great. And I, I usually recommend them. Thank you. And what are your thoughts on a spray versus a cream based sunscreen? Is it as effective? Yeah, that's a great question. So spray. Sprays uh, tend to be really convenient and they are good for particular parts of the body. For example, um, the part, the part in your hair, it may be easier to use a spray to get that done. Kids, if they're not you know, so willing to sit still and, and have sunscreen applied, it may be easier to spray. One caveat with a spray is that it's much more difficult to tell if a spray has been evenly applied and if a sufficient amount of the, the sunscreen has been applied. Keep in mind when manufacturers receive these SPF ratings, the amount of sunscreen that's being applied in these trials is much higher than what you would wear on an average day. So I typically say for a spray, you should just assume that you're getting less on and that it's going to be more uneven. I like sprays for reapplication. I think that applying, um, you know, your standard sunscreen cream or liquid base as your first um, application is going to be easiest to ensure that you have nice, even and thorough application. And if, if you're out on the out and about on, on the beach, or if you have a young child, then the spray is much easier for reapplication. But you have to be careful if you, you know, look at images, sometimes you'll see that patients will, you know, kind of have these unusual burns. And sometimes it's because uh, something like a spray was applied, and it wasn't applied evenly. So they're good, but just consider the context. And how about sunscreen sticks? compared to liquid and creams, are they as effective? Yeah, so great question. So I um, also like the sticks. One of the benefits to the sticks um, is that sometimes these are marketed uh, for children. It may be easier for them to apply themselves and learn the importance of applying sunscreen. Um, sometimes you get some of the more fun gimmicky things where they may glow if you're in a certain uh, degree of, of UV exposure. So there are benefits to the sticks. They may be much more portable, but we do run into the same issues as the spray in that it's a little bit more difficult to ensure that you have the appropriate amount of sunscreen and that you've applied it evenly. So again, I would recommend um, 
the stick or even the powder for reapplication. And when you're at home, especially because remember we talked about applying sunscreen 15 minutes before, I would say best practice would be at home, work into your routine, applying the cream 15 minutes before going out into the sun. And then you can easily throw into your, your bag for the day or your purse or um, beach bag, you can put the stick or the spray for your reapplication. And I think that's, that's a great convenience to have. Thank you. And you talked about the beach with the summer months coming up and we're all like planning for beach trips. With us putting applying sunscreen at home, is there a need to reapply right when we get to the beach? Because you know, sometimes it takes time to get to your destination. Do, are we required to reapply 20 minutes, like two hours after once we get to the beach? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say it depends on the length of your trip. If you're looking at a trip that's an hour and a half, two hours to get to the beach from the time that you applied, I would definitely recommend reapplying, um, you know, right before um, you you're on the beach or heading into the water. Another thing to keep in mind is if you're getting in the water, was the sunscreen that you applied water resistant? If that's the case, I'd recommend applying a water resistant sunscreen right before getting into the ocean and that would help as well. And I think, again, this is a great place that the spray comes in. If you put a good layer on at home, right as you get onto the beach, do a quick spray and, you know, kind of a touch up. So once you're kind of engaged in your beach activities, it's going to be harder for you to step aside and take time to reapply. So I think right when you get to the beach is a great time to reapply. Thank you. And for those who are tuning in from the New England area, should we be as concerned about the sun applying sunscreen in the cooler months? Yes, so that's a great question. I think one of the um, features on our phone that a lot of people um, don't use that we should be using if you have an iPhone or, or a smartphone is actually the UV index. So if you go to uh, the weather app or any weather app, and this is um, both on the phones and the smartwatches, there's typically a value that says UV index. So in New England, there are many cool months. If the UV index is very, very low, like one or two, not as critical to put sunscreen on, our formal statement as dermatologists is to wear sunscreen every day. But if you're really making a game time decision, if there is a low UV index, one or two, that really reflects the fact that there are not going to be, at that time, a lot of harmful UV rays. Now that could change throughout the day. Um, so I think that not only checking the weather, but also checking that UV index can help guide you. If you're getting higher numbers in that UV index five, six, and it's really climbing, you absolutely need sunscreen on. Keep in mind as well, sun, um, UV rays are able to penetrate window glass. So even if you're indoors and it's a particularly sunny day, or even in a cooler month when the sun is particularly intense around noontime, it's going to be important that you would have applied sunscreen that day. Thank you. And for those who grew up not wearing sunscreen but want to start now, can we reverse our risk of, you know, for skin cancer, the sun damage that has already happened? That's a great question. So um, there are a couple ways to think about risk. So it depends on the risk factor that we're thinking of in particular. So sun damage is typically cumulative or intermittent. A lot of sun damage, especially as an adult, has already occurred. So if you had blistering sunburns as a child, or if you had significant sun exposure as a child, certain risk factors include, um, for example, having been a lifeguard, that's an independent risk factor for skin cancer. Those are things that you can't necessarily undo. You can't take that risk factor away. Your body has already undergone that damage, but you can treat your skin to kind of improve or reverse some of that damage from the skin level. The damage in the DNA, unfortunately, is already there, but we can improve some of the um, damage at the level of the skin. So one, we wanna focus on prevention. So you should start wearing sunscreen, never too late to start. If you're just hearing this talk for the first time, start today, run to your local drugstore, pick up some sunscreen and start wearing today. But you can also speak with your dermatologist about treatments that may be appropriate for you. We have a variety of treatments that are considered preventative in dermatology. 
For example, we have light therapy. In particular, we have photodynamic therapy. This is particularly helpful for patients with a lot of sun damage. How do you know if you have sun damage? Signs of sun damage include, actually wrinkles are a sign of sun damage, brown spots, a lot of redness on the skin, some of those actinic keratoses, people may be covered in those and you may just think that you have rough and scaly skin. So those can be treated with the photodynamic therapy that we discussed. Um, there has been a recent uh, study out of our laser and cosmetic center with Dr. Avram that showed that patients who received a particular laser treatment called the Fraxel were less likely to develop um, skin cancer. So that's another treatment that you can ask about. It's technically considered a cosmetic treatment, um, but the medical treatment would be that photodynamic therapy. There are also creams that we may prescribe. So there are um, creams called chemo creams, and those can be applied to areas of sun damage to really reduce that burden of sun damage. And in the long term, these work beautifully to reduce the chance of you getting a skin cancer. So that's a great question. Thank you. Okay, so while we wait to see if we have any additional questions in the chat, Dr. Williams, are there any final thoughts you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah, so I would say thank you for having me. I think May is, you know, a great month to really think about skin cancer, think about the ways that you can reduce your burden for skin cancer, um, both non-melanoma skin cancer and melanoma. There are lots of easy ways and steps that you can take each day, including wearing sunscreen, seeking shade, and practicing sun safe behavior to really reduce your risk of uh, skin cancer. And I would encourage everyone to continue to practice those. And it is never too late to start. Start today if you haven't already started. Thank you. And for those who are interested to learn more about skin cancer, or sun, safe, sun safety, are, are there any online resources that you recommend one visit? Absolutely. So there are several um, online resources. One is the AAD or the American Academy of Dermatology. Um, the American Academy of Dermatology is our organization as dermatologists and they have amazing resources. They have an entire uh, patient centered website. So these include um, articles on sunscreen, articles on skin cancer, and there's also a great resource to help you find a, a board certified dermatologist that's near to you that may specialize in a variety of um, issues that may be your uh, primary concern. The other website that I would advocate is um, the Skin Cancer Foundation. They have excellent uh, statistics and infographics and just lots of information for patients who are interested in learning more about skin cancer and also how to prevent skin cancer. So those are two great resources that I think everyone should take some time this month to take a look at. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams, for spending the hour with us. This is all extremely helpful, especially as we prepare for the summer months ahead. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. And everyone who's joining in today, thank you so much for taking the time. Hopefully you found today's session helpful. As I had mentioned, today's session is being recorded. It'll be posted on the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely rest of the day.